Hello, Gary. Hello, Guy. You're just down the corridor from me, aren't you? I am just down the corridor from you, as is usual these days. We always seem to be in the and same. We're in floor. Luxembourg. Well, sort of. We're on an industrial estate on the outskirts of <laughs> Luxembourg. It's slightly nicer than that, I think. It's more sort of techy country, isn't it, where they put us? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it is. But anyway, today now this is it's quite funny. I almost have to apologise in advance. I'm mean, going to have to make sure this doesn't become Guy and Youth's reminiscing hour because, much like when we had your brother on, Gary. This is my oldest friend. This is the person I started playing music with. Really? It's incredible, isn't it? That it's taken yeah. you over a year to finally find his number in your Rolodex and, uh, <laughs> and decide that youth was a good person to have on. Because actually, oh, no. you, oh he's oh, hang uh, on. Guy has got, yeah. guy has got yeah. housekeeping coming that in. That was housekeeping. <laughs> oh, that was housekeeping coming Mini in. Mini bar. Yeah. Mini bar. Um, <laughs> uh, no, it, it, it's taking you so long, considering his output and his CV are quite incredible including working on three albums with Paul McCartney. I mean, making a band with Paul McCartney called The Fireman. Yeah. The third of an album of which is pretty much really a, a sort of Paul McCartney record, isn't it, really, even though it's called Fireman. Yeah. You know, producing Crowded House and, and of course, Killing Joke and, and Blue Pearl. Well, he was in Killing Joke. In fact, I think it's down to you, really to tell the audience who youth Martin Glover is. I mean, he's, he started as a bass player, but he was always going to be a producer. You could tell he was always a big picture guy. And uh, I was in the offshoot of Killing Joke, brilliant, that he started only for a little bit. But then what's interesting is he went in this dance, trance, kind of very underground direction. But youth is, he's the first person, this is what I really, really admire about him, is that, it was, there were lots of guys who did remixes and stuff for conventional rock acts, but who were from that dance world. But he's the only person who would literally have a full-on massive trance label going and do trance nights and the whole Goa thing whilst producing conventional rock albums He'd be, and pop. Everything from Banana Armor to, you know, to Crowded House to whatever, whilst doing Blue Pearl and a load of kind of Dragonfly stuff. He's so embracing of music, you know. Now he's in Spain, he's embraced all sorts of flamenco stuff. He's an extraordinary but character. Let's add a couple of more things in there. He's also worked with Gilmore and with Rick Wright, yeah. not only on the Blue Pearl album, but he mixed Endless River, the last Pink Floyd album, didn't he? Yeah, well, he's involved in some production. We'll get to that. We'll get to that. And of course, and, and somewhere in this might come out Jazz Coleman and his work on symphonic Led Zeppelin and Yes and Pink Floyd. And there's so much to dig into. Welcome to the Rock on Tours. Okay, guys, I'm ready. But it's a big tune for sure. I actually wrote that originally for Tina Turner. Of course, I had gone and found Joni Mitchell down in Florida and brought her back. I've listened to a few of them and they've been really good, man. I'm sitting in the back of the car coming into London. They're brilliant. Thank you guys for still being around, still making music, still being into it and doing this podcast. It, it's, uh, it's fabulous. So great to talk to two guys that have done this. Remember me? I'm in a band now. <laughs> it's called Roxy Music. You know this thing about the 10,000 hours of experience? Oh, yeah. To, to get good at something. When we recorded Arnold Lane, we'd done about 50 hours. The Rock Hunters podcast with Gary Kemp and Guy Pratt. Hey, Guy. Hey, youth. Hey, dude. Good. Oh, you're very loud. You're looking pretty fresh for being on tour. <laughs> <laughs> so long. <laughs> Oh, that's quite quite a cough you got there, mate. Why well, a smoker's cough, guy, as you know. Indeed. Hello, youth. Hi, it's Gary. Gary. Hello, How mate. are you doing? How are you coping with it all? It's all good. You know, we, we've had a long time in the sort of far east of Europe. I know. <laughs> with very uh, bumpy roads. Are you on a bus? Yeah. Are you no, flying a, bus. a hotel? A bus. No. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's... <laughs> It's actually much easier on a bus, to be honest, because you, you leave the hotel and you get straight on the bus and you're off. And, I love the and, bus. Yeah, I love the bus. You sleep so well on it as well. What? well not, not, on, not on Eastern European roads. roads. In. <laughs> 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 but, you know, when you're flying, it's you know, it's just, you're, yeah. you're going through security and checking it's in. It's true. And, that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And a lot of waiting around. Yeah. And if the 78-year-old Nick Mason can do it, exactly. we can. That's such an inspiration for you guys. I mean, is he coping with that? He's okay? fine. He's. I mean, it's yeah, Gary brilliant. and I complain way more than he does. Yeah. <laughs> Has he got a Ferrari bus? 
but it's interesting. He has this racing hat, which he's obviously puts on, which is when you go motor racing and go rallying or whatever, yeah. you have to stay in crappy little hotels in the middle of nowhere. And he's obviously just got himself into that zone. Oh, so there's great. been a slight worry. There's been a couple of places where, where they've put us into really, really nice hotels. And I got really off and thought, oh, no, don't remind him where he lives. <laughs> <laughs> but the other day, you know, he came down onto the bus and he said, I'm sorry I'm late. I was just watching Le Mans, the race, 24-hour race. And I said, oh, have you ever been out to watch it? He's so done I it a few it. times. I was in it yeah. five times. That's right, he yes. won it. He's got that Ferrari that won Le Mans in the 60s that's so worth like 200 million or yeah. something. <laughs> and there he is on the bus. Yeah, what, what an amazing guy. I actually got a book of his of that he did is great on fast cars and not just his collection but it came with a cd of him recording the engines revving up on all his ferraris (laughs) 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 he's just a complete enthusiast i did a thing for him once in fact with dom our keyboard player when he was assisting me he got asked to do the theme tune for you know the allman brothers thing for top gear but he got asked to recreate it doing car exhaust noises and he went, yes, of course I'll do it, which translates as, as yes, of course I'll get Guy to do it. And which also then <laughs> translates as me going, yes, of course I'll get Dom to do it. <laughs> <laughs> and, the funny, and so we had James May come down to Dom's studio. And this great line that was in the show oh, said, well. this is Guy Pratt who plays bass for Pink Floyd while they're arguing. <laughs> <laughs> But youth, the Floyd have been in your life quite a lot musically, haven't they? I mean, you've oh, worked yeah. with David and Rick, and you, did you remix their last album? Oh, you mixed their last album? No, I co-produced it. Co-produced it with David and uh, Phil Manzanera. And I did some mixing on uh, David's solo album, Rattle That Lock. But I think, yeah, the first time I met David was with Guy at some hard rock charity thing. Oh, um, what was that? wow, yes. What really impressed me with David that night was um, as it was the end of the night and he was sitting on his own at the end of the bar. And I sort of plucked up enough courage to go up and say hello and reintroduce myself as Guy's friend. And I couldn't think of what to say. I said, what are you doing tomorrow? He goes, oh, I've got an early therapist meeting. I said, you have therapy? <laughs> he goes, of course, I've come through a very difficult marriage. And I was like, what an amazing guy to reveal such a big vulnerability so early on to someone he doesn't know. Again, I thought... Who can then go and broadcast it to the world on a podcast. (laughs) (laughs) Years later, years later. How did your relationship start musically with David and them? I think that was because of this legendary concert they'd done in Venice (laughs) on a floating... uh, stage guy a uh, lovely guy to invite me to that it was amazing and well, I'd gone with a friend Andy off a mutual Kane, friend of yeah. ours Andy Kane and we both got completely way too much uh, indulgence of alcohol guy had managed to or Andy blagged me into Duran Duran's they were the San Daniele hotel I think yeah yeah <laughs> With a balcony, the best view in the whole place. And then at the after show party, which, which was at the Lido in the lagoon where they filmed Death in Venice, you know, and then there was one of the most lavish parties I've ever been to. And uh, there's so many stories about that party alone. But that guy again introduced me to Durga there. And I was, by that time, I was very, very drunk. And I said, come over to London, I'll make you a start. Durga was a backing yeah, singer, right? Yeah, that's right. I can confirm that's absolutely what you said. You said, come to London, I'll make you a star. And you did. And the other thing you said, because this is the early days of house music, remember? And because I remember, because I, I always have to have a gag. You said, come on, because I could see you as like a deep house diva. And I could see that Durga was a bit puzzled by that. I went, well, it beats being a deep sea diver. <laughs> 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 and just Durga's second name Durga McBroom Durga McBroom of course and this yeah then became Blue Pearl which was a, a huge record Naked in the Rain I mean literally about a month later she rang me up she said oh, I'm here I'm in London what's happening I was come over and I had a little bedroom studio in the in this coach house I was living in in Wandsworth Common she came into my bedroom and I just put this track together 
And literally, we wrote it in 15, 20 minutes. One of those ones. Huge international hit all over the world. Um, she said, look, I don't know about house music, electronic music. I'm into Joni Mitchell. <laughs> so I said, well, check it out, because this is what's really happening. But on the and, album, uh, Guy played on the album, obviously, but David Gilmore played guitar. You had Rick Wright playing some keyboards, didn't you? Yes, yes. So they all came out for her, which was very kind of them. And we did a fantastic version of uh, Kate Bush's Running Up That Hill, which David played on, which is Kate's version has just hit number one in America, her first yeah. big US hit. I can't believe it. Yeah, yeah. And that that's a, a poignant thing for me because I played bass on The Hounds of Love, which is, I consider, one of my greatest achievements, you know. Um, you, in fact, played my bass. You played my Steinberg. I remember you called me up and said, God, I've been asked to play on Kate Bush's album. I haven't got a posh enough bass. Great. And you came around to my house with Kate's assistant and just nicked my bass. Well, I said, you can have it. So there you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What tracks did you play on on Hounds of Love? I played on about five tracks, but I think one or two are B-sides, and but the only one that really made the cut was The Big Sky, which was a big single. Kate was like, you know, bring down your rig and anything you like, you know. And normally when I was doing bass sessions, a guy would know in those days, you'd just go straight into the desk. You wouldn't bring a big out. At that point, I had this I huge remember. half yeah. PA as a bass rig, which uh, which was made by Trace Elio. My text and roadies cursed me for it. And so I dragged that down. This guy came up from Kate's in a Volvo estate, we put it in, and it kept breaking down, and she managed to fix it. I was there for a few days. So eventually my bass guitar wasn't doing this. The guy let me is Steinberg, <laughs> which is possibly the most <laughs> ugliest guitar I've ever a seen. A of it's, beauty. <laughs> And I remember actually David doing a live TV of with Kate playing the Steinberg guitar. Doing Running Up That Hill. Doing Running Up That Hill. The only other guitarist I know who plays a Steinberg is Steve Illich, and he, he does it with that little sort of glissando effect, he calls it. It's just stroking the strings with a screwdriver. Yeah, it's a weird-looking guitar, isn't it? It doesn't have any tuners yeah. at the end, does it? And it looks yeah. a bit stunted. But that glissando effect Steve Illich does, that's... That was an initially, I'm going to put you on the spot here, Gary. That was really a Sid invention, I think. Well, yeah, you're right, because Lee, our other guitarist in the band, he plays a solo yeah. very light, which is That's what, yeah. copied from Sid, which does the... Digga, digga, right. digga, digga. And, of course, David did that. Yeah. It's a rapid, rapid right-hand sort of movement on the strings. Yeah, yeah. And David yeah. did that and the solo for Echoes, which is on the metal album. So he plays that. Mm. It plays like that because a lot of what mm. David took on as a guitar player was inspired yeah. initially by Sid and all the delays he. Of used. course, yeah, yeah. And David produced Sid's first solo albums yeah. as well. Didn't and he? and I do that part on stage every night with this mob. Yeah, the seagulls. I call. Oh no, it. no the seagulls. Different. That's a different thing. That's plugging into a wah wah pedal the wrong way round, and you just get the sound <laughs> by moving the tone control. <laughs> Right, right. Wow, wow, wow. But, but, yeah, but, but, so how was Kate Bush in the studio? What was that like? Oh, my God. I mean, when I look back now, I realise how significant that was because everybody makes records like that now. But then no mm. one made records like that. So she made this huge commitment because she'd take a long time making records. I remember her being in the townhouse for years. We did our second Killing Joke album, What's This For in the Townhouse, because I love the drum sound she got on The Dreaming, which she did the there. Too, the but stone she, room. Yeah. yeah, the stone yeah. room. The, yeah, the famous um, In the Air Tonight room. But that album wasn't a commercial success. So the next album, she used all her entire advance to build a studio and buy a Fairlight system and set it up with an SSL in her parents' um, Sussex farmhouse and um, in, a, in a sort of barn next door to it. And so instead of having a band all playing together, like the general traditional way of recording four people in the room all playing together she would do it separately this really informed what i do as a producer because what i realized she could do by doing that is really focus every atom of her attention on that one instrument and so she'd start with drums and then do basses and guitars and you know and build it up with every musician being in there solo with her so i did three four days just overdubbing to you know, these great drum tracks and some were more formed than others. And 
you know, it was just an amazing thing, you know. And then she could edit the performance very quickly on the fair, like sample it, use it on different things. Um, it was amazing. It's funny mm. you say that because I've never recorded in any other way. Because Richard James Burgess, who produced first band al- album, Journey to Glory, he recorded us all mm. separately because he was, you know, he was a, a geek. He was a tech head. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah. he was coming out of uh, landscape, you know, electronic drums. Yeah. Yeah. We did all That's the right. music separately, which allowed us, with the, to cut a long story short, to do yeah. a six minute remix dub where we'd new mm. tracks and have different instruments mm. come in. We made that record back in 1980 because we were yeah. allowed to do that. Well, I remember in the 80s, even in as a traditional way, you'd you'd often start an album where the producer would just do all the drums <laughs> and then you'd do the basses and then the guitar. You wouldn't actually hear what the arrangement sounded like until the, you just did the vocal, you know. Yeah. And that was convenient for the engineers and things like that, for separation. And, yeah, I mean, it is a convenient way of doing it. And for Kate, obviously, it worked phenomenally well because what, what you can lose is that synergy Vibe. of opposites thesis, antithesis, and synthesis, you know, and synthesis is what we want, you know. And when it's all separate, it yeah. can be a bit disconnected. But So these days, I mean, for, and for the last probably 25, 30 years, I, I go back to more of that 60s model where we're all playing in the room and yeah. I let the engineers try and work out the separation. And then once we've got the performances, the collective performances, then I can individually focus on redubbing bases or whatever. But we've got that magic on tape or on the hard drive and and I prefer that mind you when of course working with Darsby's it was always separately you know so yeah. it doesn't really matter but but I think courses for even courses. traditionally yeah but traditionally most people now with HD systems work the way Kate did on on Hounds and Love and you build it up bit by bit and she just directed it she had a very clear vision but she'd allow you to improvise do whatever you like her direction was to me was do whatever you want you know and then she'd direct from there which is great. There you go. And then the other great thing was 11 o'clock, because we'd start early, 11 o'clock in the morning, her mother would come in with this big tray of cakes <laughs> and, and tea and stuff, and she'd go, heaven's <laughs> east! And we'd all stop for half an hour and have some cake. And lovely, lovely. Guy knows her much better than no, I No, I don't. I don't even know her at all. I don't, I've, I've only met her a few yeah, times. Do. No, I don't. Yeah. <laughs> don't. Youth, because we're in that, we've been in that little world of talking about Floyd and people, and and yeah. I just wanted to finish off there before we move back, because otherwise we probably won't ever meet it again. But but the responsibility of taking on the endless river with Phil, who we know and love, how did that feel to you? The, the, the legacy that was behind you. Oh yeah, well, I mean, producing is a big responsibility anyway, isn't it? I mean, you're really taking on that artist's uh, next five years, possibly oh, 10 that's years. interesting way of looking at uh, it. Of what, yeah. what's going to happen in their lives. The decisions you make in that, while you're doing that, have huge implications to many people, including mine, you know. Um, so mm. I take it very responsibly and seriously. And that's something like Pink Floyd. I mean, once I picked my jaw up off the floor and gathered it, because David didn't invite me down to listen to some music, I thought it was some solo stuff. And I sort of quickly gathered it was Floyd. I said, this is Pink Floyd. He goes, yes, of course it is. So, you know, the problem was I had then was predominantly I'm a fan of music as as guys. And we're big fanboys, you know. What, you know, the, the idea of being allowed into this rarefied uh, room of, of a potential future and listen to an unfinished album and hear what's going on is such a buzz for me. So I was listening and I was... I was thinking, God, actually, this sounds more like the orb than it does Floyd, because <laughs> it had all this electronic stuff on it. So David's brief to me, basically, at the end of that meeting, was make it sound like us, you know. So, I, I, yeah, I, I could see, you know, because, of course, we all want to be challenging artists. We all want to make records we've never heard before. We all want to do things we've never done before. And we want to make artistic emotional statements that resonate and but sometimes when you push that threshold too far 
it doesn't sound like you. You know, it sounds like someone else, which is great if you're Dylan or something like that. And even if you're Floyd, I mean, they've reinvented themselves mm. many times, haven't they? It, sometimes it still has to fit within the template of everyone's perception of what that is. So that was kind of my role. And David had been working on it for a few years with Phil, and they'd gone into this very progressive conceptual ideas of story, which Phil had actually drawn out as a storyboard almost, which was amazing. And it'd been put into four sections of each 10 minutes long. And David gave me part one, which I didn't realize was just the first part. I thought that was it. I arranged that into a 40 minute record. David came back and goes, it's only part one. That's the first <laughs> <track>. <laughs> Oh, so somewhere out there is a 40-minute version. Well, there is a few versions, of course, but there's um, you know, there's a big spliff in the it was sky. Called, it was was called the, the project a... was called The Big Spliff originally, wasn't it? Yeah. Yes, that's right. That goes back to yeah, the 90s. Because the, yeah. there was all essentially stuff that was, it was leftovers from the division belt, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But actually, there were a few elements in my extended version of part one that we used in other parts and uh, and then we found other bits we found a fabulous tape um, in the back of a cupboard by the Astoria boat recording studio David Scott a quarter inch tape of Rick Wright and an Albert Hall sound oh playing the organ playing yes the organ. on the David Solo tour yeah, yeah. of his symphony yeah yeah and so we we turned that into a track, which was lovely. And I think they got banned from the Albert Hall. I'm not sure why. There was a, no, there was a story about, I remember that Rick used to tell me, and this has never been either sort of quashed or confirmed, which is that when they did Source for the Secrets in 1968, there was a thing that, because it had the bottom of C in it, and apparently because of the foundations of all the buildings mm. around there, it was so damaged during the Blitz, that you can only play the bottom C on that organ something like four times a year, and you have to have a signed letter wow. from the Home Secretary. <laughs> so the idea that you have to go try to and get Pretty Brittell to do that. To play the bottom C. <laughs> Fantastic. What a great story. The main rule with Floyd is that then there's only one rule is there's no such thing as too slow. That's right. It does, it does never go too fast. That's right. Well, mind you, it did on the wall and stuff. There was some sort of out and out. Well, Bill, know, Bill Bruford said something very interesting the other week. He said the thing with Pink Floyd is that it's not always as slow as you think it is. That's you know? right, yeah. It's always a groove. Yeah. I mean, even on Wish You Were Here. I mean, Dark Side of the Moon, the Nick grooves. is just, there's no one like him. There's no one like him. I mean, Nick, and that's such a minute, incremental, uncountable yeah. perception in the groove, isn't it? It's like Keith Richards' yeah. riff, you know. That swing he gets, that yeah. great drummers get, is so yeah. rare to find. I mean, it's incredible, incredible with him. And, and because, you know, the, they were brought up on very different drummers, you know, like Nick was brought Gene up on... Gene Krupa and... You know, yeah. Gene Krupa, yeah. for jazz, example. Yeah. You know, so jazz. Yeah. So yeah. where the one would shift ever so slightly, yeah. you know, mm, every mm. now and again. Mm. Let's go back a bit. Let's go back a well, long the way, funny, really. This is very funny when we talk about where it all started because um, it's together, isn't it, youth? It's you and me at school. That's right. It's yeah. our journey. We started playing yeah. music together. Yeah. Okay, boys. <laughs> yeah. We we had a band at school together above the gym. Well, this is the thing. You've got an electric guitar. I, we'd become friends. No, I think we became friends after you got the guitar. And I had a bass. So the great thing about having a bass was if anyone wanted to start a band, they kind of had to get me in because no one else had one. But, oh. um, but just to show the amazing kind of producerial skills that youth had, back then, he managed to blag us this attic above the gym, which we could use as our own personal rehearsal space. And no one got anything at that school. It was extraordinary that we had that. And we had all our posters and our pages of NME stuck up. And we had two Danset record players, which we'd somehow blue tacked together into amps. And a load of catering yeah. size yeah. baked bean tins from the kitchen yeah. for a drum kit. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and, and a record, record player. player. The record player plays the ball because if we played on our own, it sounded awful. But if we put a Stones record on That's and played right. along, it sounded amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder why. 
And only a couple of steps further from like with the tennis racket in front of the mirror to Bowie, you know. <laughs> we went to our first gig together, didn't we? With my sister. And fun enough, it's the same tour that Alan McGee and uh, Bobby Gillespie went to, which is uh, Thin Lizzy on the Jailbreak tour. We saw them at the Victoria Apollo yeah, that's at the right. Park when the room were opening. That's right. What an amazing yeah. thing. And then we did um, Nebworth watching oh. The Stones. That was... Didn't do it. We went to it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Little did Guy know at that point you would be yeah, playing exactly. Nebworth at some stage in your life. And But the thing is, both me and Guy have quite different tastes in music. We both love music. But, you know, Guy is very much who orientated, or, uh, still. I think. <laughs> yeah, it's true. And I'm, I'm very much Zeppelin. Yeah. But we both met with Floyd and things like that. Yeah, and Bowie and uh, stuff. Yeah. yeah, General Rock. Our journey is a testament to anyone out there who's a kid and thinks, oh, how can I join a band? And <laughs> what's the point? You know, follow your dreams and they can come true. You know, I mean, that could be a, a blessing and a curse. But, you know, it's like, it's just mind blowing to think that's what we were dreaming of. And then we ended up yeah. both. Having- and Alan, and the, 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 because we were pretty much the only people interested in music at school, apart from Alex Patterson, who was more your mate, who then became the orb, you know. And Lance Ellington. Ellington. Because before yeah. us, it should be pointed out, the only musician who came from our school, I think, was a sax player in the Glitter Band. That's <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, I joined the Gary Glitter's fan club when I was a kid, so I felt particularly betrayed when the <laughs> revelations came out. <laughs> well, OK, all right, I just want to say there what? were... Four bands came out of my school. I went to yeah. Dame Alice Owens Grammar School in Islington. Yeah. And four bands came out. There was um, the lead singer of Bad Manners. Whatever Buster his name Blood was. Vessel. Buster, yeah. Buster Blood Vessel. Uh, and then there was um, two years, no, three years above me was Chris Foreman, Chrissy Boy, Madness. Right. And he used to berate this young kid in my year who was the only kid who wanted to learn violin. And he used to bring his violin in and Chrissy would go, what are you playing a violin for, you wanker? <laughs> you know, or something like that. And anyway, Neil ended up in left field. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. Sat that Neil Barnes. I can't, that open and who was the fourth, Gary? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, oh, yeah, who was yeah. the fourth? I wonder. But I know how that feels, <laughs> Gary, because I before I went to school with Guy, I was at, at school in Kilburn, St Augustine's. And that's where I first started to learn... Music and I started to learn trombone and French horn actually, and uh, I had to carry my sort of uh, trombone on the bus back to Paddington where my mum was living on, and you get picked on for you know carrying an instrument in those days. I mean, watching the Pistol series I reminded me of just how violent London yeah, was yeah. in the seventies. It's such a different city now, isn't it? Um, but it was exciting, and it and it was very exciting around the punk. Well, let's talk about that because you left school and you really hit the ground running. Because I remember, because you left a year before me, and we used to get it was like dispatches from the front. Have you heard? So youth in this bank mm. or the rate. And I've um, got to say, but the rumor that flew around school it was like apparently youth has shagged gay adverts. <laughs> oh God, she was a poster girl for me. I I mean, she was absolutely the most beautiful girl I'd ever seen. And my first band, The Rage, the was, Rage. Um, such we got a tour punk, supporting them. Perfect punk yeah. band name. But she, of course she was going out with the lead singer of the advert, so it wasn't meant to be. <laughs> but she was like Bridget Bardot for young punk teenagers. But I wanted to talk, yeah, because Alex, had actually Alex Patterson from the Orbit left the year before oh, me, right, right. and he caught that first wave a bit, you know, and gone to the Roxy and stuff. I didn't do that, but I was going to clubs from the age of 14, 15 in London because I was a soul boy and I was going with Bert Higgins. Oh, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and of course, Gary, I think you were a soul boy before punk as well, weren't you? Well, no, I don't think before. I think it came after for me. So the journey for me would have been Bowie and glam and prog and every piece of rock music I could find really up to punk. Mm. And then everything was jettisoned for punk. Oh, so you didn't go to Crackers or go through the disco Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Oh. After. So, after so that. punk was, 
77, yeah. 78, mm. that's when I was going to Crackers and that's when I was getting into dance yeah. music. So when punk had kind of, for me, had gone off the boil a bit, yeah. really. So I played at the Roxy. So I played wow. with the first version of Spandau Ballet that didn't include what my brother. We played the Roxy, the Makers. Oh, wow, I never knew that. <laughs> and the Roxy was like the centre of punk. But if you look up the stuff on the internet about the Roxy, you'll find the Makers and set lists and stuff. And then we would got into soul music quite mm. a lot and dance music. And I think really the combination of punk and dance was what ended up in the Blitz Club and was what ended up Absolutely. really our first album. And post-punk really. as well. And, and most of the 80s. Yeah. I mean, most of the 80s was made up of a combination of chic and punk. That's right. right? Yeah. You were, but you uh, were hanging out with Leiden, weren't you, in that sort of post-punk area? I was because after the rage, I joined this all-girl lesbian punk band called... The stilettos. You invited me to some rehearsal to maybe do your live sound. Why I have that no have idea. Great, but, yeah, I <laughs> it wasn't a great band, but I got spotted doing a, a gig at the Acklam Hall by a promoter who was close to Leiden, who got me in a kind of spoof band with Leiden's brother called the 4 Beat Twos. And we I pretended to be Sid's brother and he was John's brother, and we got a deal with Ireland actually. And out of that deal with Ireland, I got Killing Joker deal with Ireland. And it led on to a lot of great things. And John Lydon produced that first single, One of the Lads, which is my first record. It's an amazing record, still amazing. Vivian Goldman describes it as the first proto-world dance punk. <laughs> Journalists love proto, don't yeah, they? Yeah. <laughs> it was an amazing, informative period for me because Lydon split up the pistols and he was forming Pill. And he was exiled in his big house in Gunter oh, Grove. Yeah. Couldn't go out because he kept getting attacked. So I was living in a bed sit with Alex Patterson in Earl's Court, just a few hundred yards up the road. So I'd go around and, and hang out with him. And um, we'd spend all night, you know, um, drinking Red Stripes, listening to Can and Dub, Don Letts and uh, Keith Levine, Jeanette. They, all these incredible people. That's where I first met Vivian Goldman, actually. And then Vivian would take me and John sometimes to these shabings. Oh, yes. And this is where I was getting introduced to sort of proper dub West Indian culture. And we go to these shabings in um, Pannington, Labrack Grove. Kilburn, and, yeah. And, and John would not get hassled. No one would ever bother him, even though me, John would be the only white guys in there. We'd never get hassled. And it was the most amazing revelation there of just this room, a small room, just floor to ceiling, huge bass speakers, the bass just going through every bone and atom of your body. Thick with smoke, you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. And of course, that's what really informed John with what he was doing with Pill. And helped me very much with Killing Jug, our first single, Killing Jug was very dub inspired and even had disco beats. At that point, I think we were all very bored with the limitations of punk and it's sort mm -hmm. of American blues based sort of dumb rock thing. And we wanted to bring in elements that we were passionate about, which included disco and dub and more European German progressive music like can, you know. And, but what's uh, so funny is what you're saying. Yeah. This is so interesting. It, it's like, it's like exactly the sort of thing Gary could be saying about Spandau Ballet or Johnny Marr with the Smiths or anyway, you know, it's like everyone was going on the same. Yeah, yeah. I think if you look at post-punk generally now, it's far more informative than, than and, and expressive and challenging than punk ever was. Plus, the, the great thing was punk was a reaction to things. That's limiting in itself. It didn't propose a, a, an alternative. Post-punk was all about empowering mm -hmm. yourself whether it be squatting, making your own clothes, from the raincoats to, I don't know, hot group. But it's amazing what you were drawing on. You're drawing on West Indian culture and you're drawing on the stuff that from Berlin mm. that was going mm. on and, and European industrial music, you know, that was beginning. I suppose at the heart of that would have been Joy Division. That must you used to support Joy Division, you didn't you? Killing Joe. We supported Joy Division on their, their last tour before um, Ian died, which was an amazing, significant thing for me now. And, and of course, yeah, Joy Division were a big part of that aesthetic. It was the beginning of the bass player as the lead instrument in the group. Well, that, that was that. That's, Hook is a fabulous bass player. I love listening to him always. And uh, I think also mine and Hannett's production, the dreaminess of it, and that it had moved away from just this 
angry punk. If you listen to Warsaw, their demos, it's quite kind of angry punk, but you yeah, listen to yeah, the yeah. records, it's like Pink Floyd almost, some of it, close especially. I've always said, you, this has come up on this podcast before, and I, people have already bored of it, but it's because, you know, every night we, we do we do set the controls for the heart of the sun, and I always say it's the greatest song Joy Division never wrote. Oh, okay, that's very close, yeah. actually, yeah. Let's talk about your relationship with Jazz Coleman. Uh, Jazz. Because uh, this is an extraordinary man, the lead singer of Killing Joke. But also, you know, I've read somewhere he's also an ordained priest. I mean, he's somebody who's really pushed the boundaries. He's gone off and he's, he understands orchestration. He's orchestrated, I think you work with him on, on the orchestrated philharmonic version of Us and Them and Led Zeppelin. Yeah, yeah. I actually brought him into those projects. Yeah. Um, which gave him a big break with the orchestral stuff, yeah. And they were very... Successful. I mean, Killing Joke, though. Yeah. But Killing Joke and what you mm. did, you know, the bands like Metallica and Dave Grohl and Soundgarden, I mean, there's so many of that early grunge Metallica sort of bands from America mm. that point directly at Killing yeah. Joke and say, we were inspired by you guys. Killing Joke are a very influential band. That's one of the great rewards of still being with them and the original lineup. And not only from the sort of harder rock metal end of things, you have artists like, you know, James Murphy, LCD Sound System. They're losing my edges. Got Killing Joke sample. The lyrics pretty much about me. You know, it's got a huge reach, Killing Joke, even though it's never been that commercially huge. You know, it, it's artistically, it's important. I think, you know, one of my great philosophies is, you know, not everything that can be counted counts and not everything that counts can be counted. So, you know what I mean? It's like that can apply to sales or likes on Facebook mm. or whatever. What's important is being authentic. I think what we were doing with Killing Joke was being authentic to ourselves because we we're drawing in these, you know, very different influences. And we were all very, very different. There's this other idea, again, I, I mentioned earlier, you know, of opposites. We are four alpha males, very, very different tastes in music. But you have that thesis, antithesis, synthesis thing come in when those opposites clash. You, you don't want to avoid that. I don't want to avoid that in a studio. Sometimes if the studio is too relaxed, I'll make it challenging to get that intensity. For me, all great art has intensity, and that intensity comes from that synthesis of opposites often. And uh, and so you have to learn how to embrace that. You spend a lot of time, I know you can relate to this, Gary, running away from those opposites and thinking, I just want to be playing with people who understand what I do and I <laughs> like, and we share, we, 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 we're all on the same page, you know, and then you do that and there's actually nothing really happens, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. it's only when you get challenged and thrown in with opposites that those sparks spark. That's exactly what makes a great yeah. band and yeah. why bands are best when they're formed as young yeah. people because you're, you're forming them as young people not because you're friends this is where everyone gets it screwed up because everyone thinks oh Span our Bally got together because they were friends <laughs> no we got together because we were the only kids who played those instruments in the school right. and we all had different things that we liked and I mean Tony Hadley only ended up as the lead singer because he was the only kid we knew with a leather jacket. <laughs> yeah, you know? I love and, that. and I so love that. but it doesn't mean to say you're friends or you like yeah. each other. Later on, if you form bands when you're much older, they yeah. tend to be friends, right? Well that's right. And maybe and that, not as that, exciting. That brings up a whole other vista of possible problems as well, you know. And <laughs> I just, it's a, it's such a weird they say, you know, psychologically when you a band has the same dynamic as a family and, and all families are psychotic uh, because you lose your individuality to be part of the family group. And the paradox is, you know, without the family, life is meaningless. So you, you, you're stuck in that sort of existential angst dynamic. And the great thing about those opposites is very creative. But the hard thing is how you manage it you know, mentally, psychologically, you, you have to be a trained psychotherapist to understand what goes on and not just be reacting to everybody's, you know, mood swings and stuff. And like going back to jazz, jazz is well known for not being the easiest artist to work with. But the great reward for that has been for me is that Killing Joke remained probably the hardest band I could ever work with. You know, um, Geordie, probably one of the most talented musicians I've ever worked with. None of us can get up to Geordie's skill level, you know, but he's he's not easy, and nor is Jazz. Somebody put a picture up of Sade with a guitarist in the 80s who looked like Geordie, and the guy's smiling the other day on Facebook. 
And some astute person said, no, that can't be Geordie because Geordie hasn't smiled since 1985. Because <laughs> 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 he's a tough character. He's like... But you left the band for a bit, didn't you? you I, you know, I didn't leave the band. The band left me. Jazz went to Iceland. Then one by one, they joined him. I was left standing. Yeah. The, the last man standing. And then when they all came back and said, OK, let's go, I was like, no, I'm going to form Brilliant, which was an experimental group. And which that, I was in the I first incarnation of. That's right. That's well, right. originally, Brilliant was going to be two drummers and two bass players, which is a terrible idea. It is. It is. <laughs> Unless you're Prince or something. Yeah. Like <laughs> you know, but uh, I've come to realise that those challenges, and, and especially with jazz now, those are things that I treasure in a way because it, I spent a lot of years running away from that. And you're really running away from yourself. It's that thing, you know, someone really irritates you and gets you angry. It's something in yourself they're triggering that's angry mm -hmm. it's not them you know it's a great way of resolving that and and again you've i've had to work with jazz and, and understand him without judgment in many ways and, and we are brothers as i am with god we've shared so many experiences mm -hmm. we've gone through so many ups and downs when we're in a room together it's a lovely feeling and it's a great reward now actually touring and stuff to hang out with them with all those shared experiences you know i love when you got back together is this this is this true you made you made an album pandemonium and the vocals i read were recorded in the king's chamber mm. of the great pyramid of cairo how did you do well that? you know i just uh, done uh Crowded House, Together Alone. I was flying high as a producer in the early 90s and uh, Together Alone considered the best Crowded House album now um, by their fans anyway and a lot of critics. And I'd mixed that with Bob Clear Mountain, the mighty Bob yeah. Clear Mountain, whose greatest achievement for me was actually, he's not credited, but he did it. It was mixing uh, Sheik's first two albums. That's right, yeah. Yeah, and so I, I was just... Every time we sat down for dinner, I was just asking him questions about how he got the chic hand clubs and stuff like that. <laughs> and he's very yeah. dry, you know, kind of straight down the middle guy, Bob, you know. But one day he, he opened his briefcase. Like we come in with a briefcase and a baseball hand. He's just super focused. Blah, blah, blah. Didn't smoke, drink, nothing. Just, blah, 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 you know. And there was a bag of crystals in his, in his briefcase. I said, Bob. What are you doing with crystals in your briefcase? That's not like you. You know, I'm the crystal bubba. You know? <laughs> I'm the cosmic cat. You're the straight down the line, you know, top gun guy. And he goes, oh, it's my girlfriend. She's a white witch. And she was also the manager of the plant in New York, the record plant. And uh, oh, wow. he said, we've just split up and uh, she's moved to Cairo and she's doing uh, a lot of meditations in these secret chambers under the pyramids. And I was like, wow. I said, I've always wanted to record that. Do you think she could get me in? He goes, well, here's a number, give her a ring. So um, that's what I did. I gave her a ring and she said, okay, we'll come over and we'll have a meeting about it. And she had this sort of group of, uh, there's a big American university in Cairo. So there are all these Americans that are studying antiquities and they had this sort of secret meditation group they go in these pyramids and, and I, they, we had to sort of almost audition to get in <laughs> and i've gone in with jazz ostensibly i've gone to do string session in cairo and there's some great string orchestras in cairo cairo is like the center of the middle east film and music is because jazz studied eastern music didn't he Jazz is self-taught, as we all are, I think, um, which is a huge achievement. I always thought he was like conservatory trained. No, no, no. He's had a few tutors mm. and um, what are they called? The uh, tone meisters, you know. And when you're doing a, an orchestral session, a tone meister comes in, checks the score, you know, and sort of edits it, reviews it while you're recording, don't makes last minute changes. He's had a couple of cats who've really taught him out of that, but he's done it himself. Same as Will Malone, my favorite string oh, yeah, arranger yeah. I did the birth with. He got had to arrange and do strings from reading a book. Now I love all that because I'm self-taught and it gives me hope, you know. And I've actually just written a symphony over the last 10 years as well. And you shouldn't let anything stop you doing what you what you really want to do, you know. we especially coming from Britain, you're all we're all brought up to believe, oh, don't think you're better than anyone, don't think you could do this, stay in your box, you know. And you know, I think you, you you really got to follow your dreams to find out who you really are. Back to Cairo. Yeah, so Cairo, yeah. yeah. So anyway, <laughs> yeah. 
So there's me and Jazz with about 10 women and one guy. And he said, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I think we want to do like, like an exorcism. One of the tracks was called it, and a kind of meditation. And he goes, gee, you're not a Satanist, are you? And Jazz goes, I don't believe in Satan. And all the women are like, oh. and he goes, well, nor do I. So like, how can I be a Satanist? And that was it. We got in. And I had a couple hundred bucks to the security guy. We had two evenings after the tourists had gone. I got them to turn all the electricity off so we could do it with candles. And we got into the king's chamber. I've been in there. It's terrifying in there. I did, not for me. You're so jazz. deep in it, the pyramid. Well, actually, Jazz had, had a major meltdown on the first night and he was drinking, which he shouldn't have done. The next <laughs> night, I sort of shamanically changed it around and uh, we had these three women in the Queen's Chamber and just three guys in the King's Chamber. But one of the Egyptian engineers we were with fell asleep, woke up seeing all these thousands of eyes of Horus and went mad afterwards what? and uh, never went in there again. It was quite a strange Didn't one. you say all the batteries died on the DAT machines? That's stuff. right. Yeah. There's film really of it weird. on YouTube and the guy who was filming it had all these batteries and the way I recorded it was those like portable DAT machines. Mm -hmm. So you, you could record one side of the left, right would be the vocal, the other be the backing track and bags of these batteries for both the DATs and the uh, videos. And uh, and they, they were supposed to last two hours each. They lasted like four minutes. Wow. And they'd be boom, boom, boom. It was very strange. It was like taking very, very strong DMT ayahuasca. It was a complete cosmic trip, that recording session. Was it hot in or cold in there? What was the air conditioning so off? Bizarre. Or the the room isn't that big, the King's Chamber. It's got those gold mean dimensions. And there's this big empty sarcophagus at the end. But it sounds like you're in St. Paul's. It sounds like the vastest, biggest reverb you've ever heard. And what tracks are sung I think in there it was the Exorcism and Whiteout and maybe Labyrinth. And then the, the second night where it, where it really happened, we got the vocals, everything went smoothly. I'd done a little ceremony before and that kind of seemed to ease it. Well, <laughs> as we came out, it was about 10 o'clock at night. There were these Bedouins that set up a camp and there were fires and there was a party. It was biblical. I'd, I'm one of the most epic things I've ever done. What do people want from you, youth, when they get you in to produce? I mean, when you went down to New Zealand to work with Neil Finn and Crowded House, what did they want you to to deliver do they want you to create a vibe as well i don't know sometimes i do bring a vibe <laughs> which can help and sometimes can't you know it depends every artist is different as you know and everybody's at that point of time in their life their requirements are different part of being a producer is being able to read the room in that sense and be able to work out what it is they not only want but what they need you know and be able to facilitate that so, you know, with, with Crowded House, they had a huge album, Woodface, produced by the amazing Mitchell Froome, which guy you've worked with. Yeah, Mitch, yeah, 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 yeah. But he's very... Elvis, Elvis Costello's producer, yeah. He's a very traditional producer. You know, and I think he told me on Woodface in LA, they bring in, you know, these top session guys, unbelievably, because Crowded House are phenomenal yeah. musicians, but... The rhythm section would often be Steve Gadd or someone like that. So when I started recording and rehearsing them in New Zealand, we'd rented this house and turned it into a studio. The drummer, Paul, and the bass player, Nick, were like, oh, are you just toying with this? You don't have to play with this. If you're going to get your session, guys, and we don't want, we want to make a great record, whatever way you want to do it, but just don't patronise us with pretending to do, you know, arrangement rehearsals. I'm like, no, 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 we're going to do it like a traditional album. We're going to make a classic album. Actually, Neil told me later, he'd like that I've had a lot of success with dance music, which was just emerging. And he liked the idea of doing a lot of loops and stuff. And I was like, actually, I want to make a timeless classic album. I don't want to make a gimmick album. His first solo album after that was full of loops and stuff. And uh, and, and it was OK. But I mean, I think with Crowned House, we did loop up drums and do some experimental stuff. But I really wanted a timeless classic. So I think that's what they needed as well. And I wasn't going to try and chase the party of following Woodface because that was such an amazing production. Mm -hmm. I thought what we're going to make here is just a beautiful sort of their dark side of the moon sort of thing. And uh, I got this theory that, you know, when you're making records, your music doesn't lie. And so 
you know, whatever you put in, whatever the vibe is going in to the record is kind of what comes out at the other end, you know. And so it is very important to get the atmosphere and vibe right because that gets recorded. If it comes out sounding over-considered, it's because they've spent two years over-considering it, you know, and because it doesn't lie. So the vibe, you've got to get that right. So the other thing that the guys thought, in their YouTube documentary on the making of Together Alone was that they picked me because I was the least like a, a normal producer and they were fed up with normal producers. They'd also been on the road for 18 months. They were on the verge of splitting up. So my angle on it was let's make an album that we can really enjoy. We'll rent this house yeah, by yeah, the yeah. sea in New Zealand. We'll climb walls. Was that the house that Sam Neill stayed in when he was doing the piano? Or was that where you were staying? That's right. Yeah. It was the production yeah. hub for that. And then... But And then, then we rented this other house that Jane Campion had been in. It was just on the edge of the burr. And, and we all lived in that. And that lasted about a week. And then everybody got their own house <laughs> in the valley. We ended up taking up over the valley. But it was such an amazing experience. I was experimenting with group bonding, going, walking back from the studio across this valley ridge with no moon, no lights, barefoot. And I'd say, look, you just have to trust your feet. And I'd lead and, and we'd do, let everybody put a hand in front of, on the shoulder of the person in front of them. We start off walking and, uh, and start chanting, ah, ah, and then we start running literally into the black abyss. And for somehow your intuition kicks and your feet find the path, you know, and we'd all make it down, you know. And, and afterwards, the, the session would feel like days ago and you'd feel incredibly refreshed and challenged. So I was experimenting, doing a lot of things like that to okay. make it fun and, and to bond the group, you know. That's what you want from yeah. youth, isn't it? That's what you want from youth. <laughs> That's what you'd expect. When I was in the Olympic in the 90s, I'd block book Olympic for six months and do James and I'd just do the hunt, loads of records. I was trying to up, up bring in oil wheel lights, smoke machines, shrine yeah. up the studio space with Indian hangings. I do that with McCartney. And his yeah, I remember some friends of mine going into one of your studios once yeah. and, and it was like you couldn't see <laughs> <Yeah>. anything because <laughs> <laughs> the, the smoke and the Yeah, the tape ops would be <laughs> cursing me because after my sessions, I'd have to pull out every SSL strip and get a Q-tip with alcohol and clean off the oil residue from the oil lamps and smoke. Blowing sage smoke into the DAT machine yeah. is not really yeah. a good idea, is it? <laughs> well, I mean, well, well for Lee Perry. I do that a lot. And, uh, you know, I just make it into a, a bit more of an event, you know. I mean, some days you wouldn't want all the lights and you just, you know. But I in McCartney's studio, I put up all these Indian hangings. When I went back 10 years later, we tend to make our album every 10 years He's still got them up, you know. <laughs> I don't know. All right, let's talk about Paul McCartney. Because wasn't it you did that great big piece in Q, didn't you? It was something like, can this man save the world or save music? And McCartney yeah. saw yeah. that. And is that how he got yeah. in touch with you? Yeah, he read that. And, you know, those cats are super on it. They work with the best people who are around, basically. they Same with David mm -hmm. and Pink Floyd. They have the best teams around them. And when they come to make records, they want the best producers of the day, you know. And so this article in Q had, had said that, uh, could this man say pop music? I was having a lot of pop hits. And, you know, he read it, liked it. And I'd, I'd actually reference that the Beatles had, had started the, almost the sampling craze with Tomorrow Never Knows and McCartney's right. tape loops and stuff like that. A lot of people think that was Lennon, but that was McCartney, you know. And, and uh, anyway, he rang me up and uh, and said, would you like to remix the track? And I said, oh, OK. And then I went down and he played me some tracks. I said, just let me loose on the, the multi-tracks and I'll construct a new piece out of all the different sounds. And then you can overdub that. And, we're, and he, but that, that was the first one, which is called Strawberry Ships, Oceans, Forests. Um, what McCartney album was it that he was, he was, was working on? Was the ground, on? maybe? No, I'm not sure. Um, I think it was off the ground. Right. But, you know, I thought, he said, oh, that's a bit different. Has anybody done that before? I said, no, no one's done it like that before. He said, okay, let's do it. And I realised later, he mentioned it, a lot of the things the Beatles did were things that no one had done before. So I started making suggestions to him that, nobody had done before and, I, and he always liked that and i thought that's a really good way of what we're going to do next let's do something nobody's done before that's a great way of looking at it artistic 
Paul's again another self-taught genius polymath, but he's been around a lot of formidable artists from the Jane Asher days around Indica Gallery and that bohemian uh, sort of group that was around there. Yeah, because everyone thinks that John was the sort of arty one because of Yoko, but that was late to the party. No, right? exactly. Right. And he was down in That's Weybridge. Right. You know, Paul mm. was right in you know in Abbey Road mm. at the heart of it. And people think John's a working class one and Paul's a middle yeah. class one. And John's the tough one and Paul's the nice one. And it's all the other way around, <laughs> actually. You know. But uh, you know, Paul, yeah, was surrounded by that. And also when he was with Linda, Linda's uh father, Lee Eastman, was the lawyer for all the great New York uh abstract expressionist artists like Pollock, uh, de Kooning. And whenever he was in New York, mm -hmm he'd go and see and hang out with de Kooning in his studio and things like that. One of the most amazing things he said to me once, and I, I said, what was it like with de Kooning? And he's got a lot of de Kooning paintings as well, you know. And he said, well, you know, one day I was in the studio and he had this big abstract and it was all soft, pale pinks. And I sort of said to him, because the question I asked Paul, I said, when did the penny drop that you could do anything you like? you know, and not have any boundaries, be poet, compose, whatever. He said, it was in de Kooning's studio. He's looking at the painting and he asked de Kooning, he said, what is it? And de Kooning stepped back a couple of paces, looked at it, scratched his chin and sort of said, kind of looks like a sofa to me. And <laughs> that was the moment where he thought, it doesn't matter. And actually, I, you've got to look at, uh, if you haven't already seen them, Paul's paintings are yeah. phenomenal. Yeah, yeah. There's paintings. But didn't he... The covers of those three Fireman albums were, were Paul's paintings. No, no, one no, and two no. Of them. Well, the first one is actually a photograph of uh, a letterbox by Linda. Oh, okay. And uh, the third one, we decided he's got a good relationship with St. Martin's, possibly because Stella had gone there. He may have helped them out. Some, but they let him have this big studio. And we went in for the day and had all the art supplies and we just painted and got creative, messy. And out of those paintings came the third album scene. Because we both painted. When I work in the studio, I'm, I'm often drawing or painting while we're listening and, and stuff. And, right. and I like to have a creative flow going. Because you know what it's like in the studio? It's all kind of hurry up and wait, stop, start, you know, wait for that to be tuned, unplugged in. I like to keep my mind moving. And I like that momentum to keep those wheels to keep turning. So while they're tuning up, the engine is getting in sound, I'll get my pad out and start drawing, you know, so that keeps my my flow in a way. And so Paul does that as well. So we really clicked in, in that way. And and that, don't forget, it's his birthday this week. Paul said he thought you could be an artist. He said he thought you have Yeah, no, he, he, he really encouraged me. And it's his birthday this week. It's his 80th birthday. Yeah. And he's on tour. Oh Isn't that incredible? Yeah. It's, yeah. it's fantastic, amazing. I mean, that's a huge uh, inspiration to us all, isn't it? That last album, the electric, because the first two albums that you yeah. did with Paul were instrumental yeah. albums, and then that last, and you hid that everyone was not meant to know yes. it was Paul at all, you know, and it was Paul's secret band. Yeah. But the last album, Electric Arguments, that's pretty much a Paul McCartney solo album, if you like. It's vocally Paul, isn't it? So Paul wrote all the songs, I'm guessing, or did you write with him? youth i helped him i had their his songs i helped him but how was it watching him write in the studio it's a very difficult place to be as paul mccartney sometimes as you can imagine because you know the expectation of paul mccartney is the, the most famous musician on the planet the most accomplished artist on the planet alive is unbelievably vast and you're uh, it's this huge height looking down how can i ever do another band on the run how can i ever do another sergeant peppers paralyzes many great artists mm -hmm. that why they don't often make great records and they get later so with paul the the idea of how do you write a great song you know can be very very challenging so on the second album, Rushes, there was one song where he did a, a little refrain, Let Me Love You, which is absolutely beautiful. And we got stuck on a lyric. I made the big mistake of saying, maybe you could take that home and write a better lyric. And he went, oh, is that the time? <laughs> <laughs> See you later. <laughs> and, and, you know, that almost killed it. And so when we got to doing electric arguments, we, I was giving him a very strong directions. I get in really early because I'd actually read that 
Dick James got the publishing deal of Northern Songs because he was the first to ring up and he said he wanted a 9am meeting and Paul was impressed that he was up at work in the office at 9am <laughs> because Paul's a hard-working, working-class lad, right? He respects stuff like that. So I thought, right, I'm going to get in the studio at 9am and get prepared. So I go in at 9, which well, his engineers weren't that happy about all mine, but they're professional. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd start looping up samples of different things that I thought could be a good vibe for that day. And Paul works fast. I like working fast. So Paul will come in about 11 and he go, what have you got? And I got like three or four little ideas. That's what do you think? Go, oh, I quite like that one. And that might be one I based on a Fairport convention thing. He also on those albums, he liked, even though he's a good Catholic boy, he quite liked the idea of us recording on pagan festivals, like the Equinox, the Solstice, and so every session we do would be on one of those festivals. So there's something magical about that as well. I don't know, the sort of veils part a little bit cosmically. <laughs> we would go in, we, we would sometimes do two tracks a day from nothing. And he'd pick up a little loop idea, beat I kind of got going, and then, we'd, and then I'd direct him into overdubbing to it and developing a chorus and a middle eight. And we get to that point, and I'd go, well, do you know what, this really really is suggesting it needs a vocal and a lyric point. You know, what do you think? He goes, well, we tried that. I don't want to go down that path. I said, I've got a different plan for this one. He goes, what's that? And I've, because I've worked with many artists as a co-writer, producer. I am essentially a writer, producer. And so I've written a lot of songs. I've tackled that mountain many times. So I said, OK, one of the great things I loved about what you did with Sergeant Peppers, this was part of the reason he loved the fireman was Sergeant Peppers, they pretended to be another band, Sergeant Peppers. And in doing so, they could forget about being the Beatles. And they'd be like, what would Sergeant Peppers do on this track? Well, how does Sergeant Peppers? There's a whole other mindset of looking at what you're doing. And it just takes it away from it being that, you know, and you can just then go back to having fun and exploring that, being creative. So, you know, with the songs, I said, look, the benefit of Mr. Kai, the lyrics are that verbatim. Off a poster, a yeah, circus, circus poster, poster, yeah. Right? Beatles constantly referenced newspapers, you know, day in the life, took stuff from everywhere. I mean, a good example is Electric Arguments, the album title. So I said, look, once we get to the point of Duvo, I brought down like a, a two big bags of poetry, books and literature. I said, we sit down, we'll go through the books and it's like a game. I say, you've got to pick three words from three random poems in three books, put them down. And then we'll, we'll explore the Ginsburg idea, see if that turns into a phrase or take a phrase or just a word. We'll, and then we'll cut them up, throw them up, see where they land, see if they form sentences. You know, it's that cut up Ginsburg thing that Bowie did very well. And many people have done that. And you get this sort of a little bit more of an abstract thing. But it can just get those wheels turning. And and then I said, you've got 20 minutes, see if you can turn it into a lyric. So we do that. And in fact, the title Electric Arguments is uh, is a line from a Ginsburg poem. And um, right. I'm actually, it's a tangent, but I'm all, I've done an album with Ginsburg's poetry. And we're looking at uh, an anniversary of the uh, Poetry Olympics from 67. Well, the Albert the Hall. Hall. All right, right. Yeah themed yeah, on Ginsburg yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, we're talking to Patty Smith. I'm hoping Paul... Wasn't Paul there? I think Paul yes. was there. Um, well, there's still some surviving other members of that. And I want to get them with a whole load of new poets, uh, you know, contemporary poets, great. all doing Ginsburg's work. Be great to get you involved, Gary. I know you're a great artistic, uh, poetic man yourself and God. <laughs> and, um, you know, recreate that kind of summer of love vibe. People say Amazing. that Poetry Olympics event was precipitated, kick-started that summer of Absolutely, love. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. And I think we could all do with something like that again. But anyway, going back to the lyric, with that, I, literally, Paul would do that, reference a few words, 15 minutes, he goes, I'm ready, and he'll have a song. And then we put it yeah. down to two or three vocals, cut the harmony. Because this is the thing about Paul, isn't it, really? And I guess this is why you're there as well, is I get the impression that we've said this before, that Paul is a very unfiltered songwriter. He's not got that voice saying, oh, I can't release that, I can't release this. He keeps writing. He keeps putting it out. Sometimes it hits, sometimes it doesn't. That's right. And we all know as writers, um, 
you know, there's a certain amount of numbers. So you write 30 songs, maybe three or four are great. Same with paintings, you know, and, and true, you get to this mastery point where everything you do is just great. And I think if you've got the confidence to throw yourself in, just throw yourself in. Fortune favors the brave. The gods work with you. It comes through. It opens the door. And all for those songs, you know what it's like. They're already there. You're just kind That's of throwing right. them down. Plucking out the ether, you know, yeah. you're just kind of filling in the gaps. And so the techniques to get in there, so they can come through. These are the oldest arts. Oldest arts, you know, are all shamanic, magical. All theater, drama, music, all comes from ceremony thousands of years ago. So going back into a, a, a kind of shamanic space, the veil parts a little bit, you know. I mean, I, listen, we've got to talk about something else because you seem to be in every era, in every genre, don't you? But you made one of the biggest, you know, let's use that word Britpop, albums ever with urban hymns. I mean, you know, this is a time when, you know, everyone was forming a band. All you needed was a bucket hat and a fisheye lens right? <laughs> uh, to be in one of those bands. But it just so happens that this bucket out of this fish eye lens <laughs> was massive with the Verve. Well, he'd been around for a long time, didn't he? He had been around for a long time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was a uh, third album, I think. Uh, but I think it fulfilled the promise of Britpop because it kind of went back to classic, timeless album philosophy, really. We weren't chasing the, the Stone Roses, mm-hmm. you know, Weather all be. Um, what we were doing was trying to make classic records and we were referencing 60s, 70s records. And Richard was writing these most beautiful, incredible songs, yeah. you know. Bittersweet, he wrote to a sample of The Last Time by the Andrew Lou Golden Orchestra. Uh, famously. Well, whose idea was that? Was, was no, that, Richard was that had done that idea? himself. Um, oh, I thought it was your idea. The demo of him just singing along to a loop off the record was pretty much, the vocal's almost identical to the finished record, actually. Because it's interesting when we talk to 90s artists, is that, and especially, and you've been saying this yourself, that all three of us come from a world where we grew up where you just want to hear something you've never heard before and all the music we were interested in was music was moving forward. And now you're talking about what is an absolute 90s thing of you're trying to make a classic album based on what things sounded like in the past. How is that for you? That's, yeah, pop will eat itself. Yeah. When it, and it's cyclical, I think. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's one of those things. When we left school, I was going to go to art school. Mm. I got accepted at, to Chelsea. And I thought there's no point doing music because there's no way I'm ever going to be as good as Jimmy Page or mm. there's no way I'm ever going to write songs as, as profound as Bob Dylan. It's, I thought it had all been done. Mm. And I thought there was a lot more scope for being innovative and experimental, challenging as an artist than as a, a musician or a writer. But then punk happened. And I suddenly realised, oh, it's not over, it's just started. Mm. And, of course, music culture, it is cyclical. Most of our lives are cyclical, yet we still rigidly try and see it as a straight line, beginning, middle and end. Of course, it's endless. It just goes round and round and round. And, of course, those traditions, those traditional folk traditions, are all about drawing on the past, combining Mm -hmm. it with your own story and making something new again. Well, I think music and art are always led by the medium and by technology and discovery. Mm. You know, I've just been reading Bob Stanley's book on pre sort of rock Mm. and roll pop history. And that moment when the the ribbon microphone appears, suddenly people don't have to shout loudly to the gallery or loudly into a horn to make a record. Mm. They can sing softly. And so crooning was invented. You know, when you made that, had that thought about everything's been done, technology was about to change Mm. and give you another medium to work within, which you took on board. And that's what allowed you to to become who you are. Something was a huge revolution. But isn't it strange and mind-boggling that those mics that were made in the 40s, some of those Neumann 87s, have never been better today. I've said that often. I I say it's like if Beyonce goes to make an album tomorrow, if she can use Frank Sinatra's old mic, that's what she'll use. Mm. Guy's right. You know, no matter what goes on digitally, that seems to be... The, uh, the the still is that technology is not enough. No. But same but, with guitars, same with especially with guitars and cars. Yeah, that is mindful. The but the sampling. Yeah, when sampling became longer than three seconds, say, yeah. which it pretty much was in the eighties. That's the moment we started looking back more in music. Oh, possibly, and that that brings us back 
But bands were already doing yeah. that. I mean, Beatles were referring the F, F. Lee Brothers. Everybody's doing yeah. that anyway. Yeah. Vaudeville, they were referencing yeah, Vaudeville. Yeah, everybody's, uh, you know, referencing their own personal jukeboxes of what they grew up with anyway. So It was in the 90s that became overt. Mm. Well, the person, again, brings us full circle back to Kate Bush, really. It's Kate Bush and Peter Gabriel who started making records with Fairlights yeah. and later Trevor Horton. That defined what that was going to be mm-hmm. then. And then by the mid to late 80s, samplers suddenly got a lot cheaper. Oh, those Akai's, God, they were a nightmare. I've still got them, <laughs> I, but they sound great. Yeah. I mean, I think the S900 was 16, but it still sounds amazing. You know, a lot of kids today, of course, like using that early technology, sampling technology now, 8-bit technology. That becomes exotic. Talking about sampling, Youth, you worked on the PM Dawn set Adrift on Memory Bliss. That's right, I remember single, that conversation. Which was sampled yeah. true. Yeah. What, were you involved from the ground on that with John? With John Baker. With Mole. With John yeah, Baker. John Baker. Yeah, yeah, Mole, with... that's right. Mole. As Mole. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you remember Blues? And he was the Mole. manager of PM Dawn, yeah. Yeah. He was the label, G Street. But years before, yeah. but in the punk days, John had a, a stall in Kensington Market, Kensington Market. called Blues, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know. And he was one of the big faces at the time, you know. Yeah, he it was, was probably yeah, second yeah. wave. There's some great footage out there on YouTube yeah. of me and him and a bunch of my brother and a bunch of us all doing some fashion shoot with his clothes and the Kensington Market guy's clothes. He was always sharp. He's still sharp. That hotel's one of the best hotels I've ever stayed in. He's got a hotel in, uh, in Jamaica. Port Antonio in Jamaica. It's one of the best hotels I've ever stayed in. It's sublime. But tell us about PM Dawn. So, well, PM Dawn set him up, set me up a bit as well because he'd signed them and discovered them. He'd also signed um, Jungle Brothers and Della Sol. He had great ears, you know, and um, then licensed them to Island and uh, and I got me in to mix them at the time I was having a lot of hits and my mix engineer was Mark Stent oh and Spike, Spike who, yeah yeah Spike yeah he's just mixed uh, my solo single last there you year go. Yeah. so he's still in the top 10 mixers mm-hmm. in the world along with Bob Clear Mountain and absolute genius mixer but at the time he was coming through he, well, I discovered him tape popping on a KLF session believe it or not and brought him in and started getting him to do all these mixes I had about a year and a half two years where I could use him as a mix engineer before you know I, then I went on holiday I think me and Nelly Hooper were kind of blocking him out between us and then we both went on holiday at the same time turned down a couple of gigs as I was on holiday when I came back Spike had done them and Spike was no longer available (laughs) but he actually a few years after that he came back to me and said would you let me engineer a recording album you do? I said, Spy, you're one of the biggest mixers in the world. What do you want to do that? And he said, I've got aspirations and ambitions to be a producer. I want to see what you do. I really respect what you do. So I got him in through uh, engineer a James album I did, which was very successful. But he found it difficult. And then when he did his first production, I think it was a Utah Saints thing, he spent two years doing it and it didn't come out great. It drove him nuts. I think he gave up with it. Oh, no, he did the bit. He gets more money uh, remixing. Oasis is uh, Be Here Now as well, I think, which didn't work that well either. But, yeah, I think you make a lot more money as a mixer, as I discovered at the time, you know. But um, So did you mix the single of PM Dawn? Did you mix the actual track? Yeah, John got me in to mix the first three singles, and... um, they were all top five hits. I think one set of drift was number one, you know, in America. Huge hits. And, you know, the basic sessions were pretty rough and raw. In fact, John, as an astute business, I don't know if it is that astute. He, he ended up, uh, me and Spike used to moan about this a lot. The labels bands get us in to do the singles. And then when they put the album out, they put their own mixes on. It's ostensibly so they wouldn't have to pay the royalty to me or Spike, you know, and they'd make more money. But you get an album and it's like, oh, this doesn't sound like a single. And the album sales would suffer, you know, because you didn't have the yeah, yeah. the authentic single on the albums. Um, yeah. I remember Massive Attack did that as well. It actually didn't make any difference. But you listen to Unfinished Symphony, it, the, the single mix, Spike's mix, is way, way better than the album mix. But you can't criticize the churlish to criticize yeah. that album there. It's such yeah, a classic. Yeah, yeah. But actually, yeah. the single mix is better, I think. So John, 
in his infinite wisdom, decided not to use our mixes on the albums. Otherwise, we would have made loads more money. But we I, we still did well with the singles. They're number one in America. And I remember saying to you, I've just mixed a record. It's gone the number one. It's your first number one in America, Gary. It was. <laughs> Ten years later, I saw you. won't believe this. He, go, he said... Fuck PM Dawn. We've just, we, I've just won an ASCAP award for a million plays of True in America because it was on some movie, wasn't it? That like, really, that, True was a top five hit in America anyway, wasn't it? No, five million plays. And five million, yeah, yeah fantastic. <laughs> well, that was about ten yeah. years ago. So, yeah, congratulations on that. That's a huge achievement, isn't it? Well, what is nice about being sampled? is the sort of how, how your relevance can appear and mm. pop up amongst new music mm. and younger music as it goes through. Yeah. And people sampling the samples. Yeah, yeah. You know, like people now have sampled PM Dawn's yeah, yeah, record, yeah. for example. Yeah, I love that. In, you know, it's the layers of reverberation. I've always said Acid House is, a, is actually folk music. In, in a way, that's what folk music yeah, yes. do as well. I love that. It's, yeah. it's passing on the baton a bit, isn't it? It's Homeric, Homeric. Oh, right. <laughs> that, like, like, Do you know, like, as in Homer, it's yeah, yeah, passed, yeah, down, yeah, yeah. passed down orally. The Greek. <laughs> I, I, I like it. With, with McCartney, though, you've got to be careful. I remember one of the guidelines I had with McCartney was don't reference the Beatles, you know, because that's what every producer does with McCartney. And it comes yeah, up, of course. you know, we're, we're all in danger of becoming our own tribute bands you know, if, if we're not careful yeah, get the melatonin yeah. Yeah. so you know I, I'd say okay we can have influence from bands that influence the Beatles but not the Beatles and at the time Wings still weren't that hot I mean Wings were, were actually hot I remember Wings Across America oh, that same album. here it was fantastic it. yeah it's a great album but critically album. they weren't cool even when we were doing the Fireman so I thought okay Wings are good to reference because the critics don't like wings, you know. So I was actually referencing things like um, Red Rose Speedway, uh, some of his solo stuff as well, uh, Band on the Run, of course, um, Venus and Mars. Yeah. You know, and what was yeah. thrilling for me was even though we wrote those songs sometimes two or three a day, well, Paul did, I helped, Rolling Stone and other critics, it's getting a lot of love at the moment, still say that Electric Arguments album's best album we made since Band on the Run. You know, some of the best songs. Yeah. He still plays two or three of those songs live in his set. It is great. And one of them's on his greatest yeah. hits, McCartney album, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. And so that's the kind of success and achievement I'm looking at. It's, which is like artistic, influential, innovative work, you know. And doing that with an artist of that statue is very, very hard. Mm -hmm. As you know, you know, yeah. it's, 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 it's very, very difficult. What's next, youth? What's next? I you? just had LaRue in yesterday, actually. Oh. So I do some... oh, she's great. Talking about electronic 80s stuff. Yeah, yeah, fabulous. Um, I just did some mixing and um, dub mixing and writing with her. I've just finished a Gina Birch album from the Raincoats. The Raincoats were... Oh, a yeah, yeah. Was Incredibly a, influential band. band. Yeah. Huge, yeah. Kurt Cobain. Kurt Cobain, exactly, band. yeah. Vivian Goldman, my old friend from Gone to Grove Leiden days, we, we were writing at the moment and um, making a record. I think it's wonderful. Like, Viv's just about to turn 70. Yeah, I, I, I've got to thank Paul for this as well, that you can keep going in our 60s and 70s now. It's like, yeah, that, yeah, that was yeah. never on the agenda, was it? We yeah. never, ever yeah. saw that. And, but, you know, we're out here with Nick and it's fantastic, yeah. you know. I've had managers who said, like, oh, your career will last three, five years. It doesn't go beyond that as an artist or a producer unless you're very, you know, unique and lucky. And it is a transient, disposable world, pop music. And, and to sustain careers 20, 30 years on, it's a huge achievement for anyone at any level, I think. So I feel very blessed. I've had a lot of success. And still keen, I still feel like I've just started, really. I'm just beginning to learn what what I'm doing and 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 also you know like you guy and I'm sure you Gary you know my motivations in making music is um you know the, the doing is the reward but it's it's all about sort of developing a lifestyle you know enjoying the life we've, we've mm -hmm. given and uh, and having great adventures and and meeting amazing people and that's why we do it i think isn't absolutely. it absolutely well youth it's been really yeah. inspiring talking to you i mean really inspiring well, you, it makes gary. me want to go and Love create to to this you, minute well, it was really nice and yeah. i'm glad gary took the helm because it would have got too 
<laughs> schoolyard. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's great talking to Gary because it's great seeing you guys. But you know, Gary again is a very, a very different journey from yeah, both yeah. you and me, really. And, and that's a fascinating journey in itself. You know, I was talking about chant number one, nine, isn't it? One. It's chant number chant one. Number it's revolution one. number chant. nine. Chant number one. That's <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I think that track was I was a track I loved. Early track I found as I loved it because it really took me back to the Soul Boy days. That's right. It almost sounds like Beggar and Co or something like that. Where did that come from? Well, that was that was. I remember writing that. You know, it was based around a bass line. Really, mm. it was I suppose about you know electronica seemed to you know our synth first album had, had been very you know influential yeah. as well. A lot of bands were doing mm. that. There was a lot of people out there, and I just think. Blitz Club had closed and this new club had opened, Sam Moritz, and people were playing old soul music. Oh, that's Robert right. Elms was playing old soul now, music. Now, who was the DJ there? Well, but Robert Elms was the DJ Robert there. Elms, that right, and he went funk. Because prior to that, everyone was going East Europe, weren't they? You know? Yeah, and I think we were just looking at some other... Sort yeah, of, and then you be... suddenly went disco, and you're like, wow, yeah, that's yeah, radical. Yeah, 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 but yeah, also, yeah, that's yeah. kind of what they were playing at um, Blue Rondo, I remember. It was like right. going to... Yeah. Just the same time. I went to the uh, Pistol uh, premiere the other day, and all right, let's finish up. What do we think of what do we think of, the, of Pistol? I actually did a review of it for Land and Wall, and most of the reviews have been pretty critical and, and and online damning. But I loved it, and there were a lot of first wave punks there. They loved it. I thought you've got to remember, it's not a documentary; yeah. it's a drama, and yeah, as yeah. such, you can forgive that Steve Jones doesn't look like Steve Jones. But some of the accents are pretty good. They do look a bit clean cut from what it was actually like. Yeah, of course. Some of the details were fantastic. And some of the performances, Vivian Westwood was great. I think the kid who plays Steve is great. The rehearsal rooms, they were all very, very detail led. And I thought that if I was 16, 15 watching that, that would inspire me to join a band. That's what it's Well, about. no, that's absolutely true. I mean, Guy and I, when we've all been just talking about it, I really dig it. And I think it's really kind of, it's glamorous to a certain extent, you know, because it is a drama and it's slightly yeah. cartoonish and theatrical. Yeah. But my God, the stories were fantastic, weren't they, that happened? At, and, and my 18-year-old loves it. Yeah, I'm only, on, I'm only on the second episode. I mean, the thing I find most convincing so far is the guy playing Leiden because you really see the birth of... You go, of course, you can mm. see exactly, you know, how that was born and created. Yeah. Anyway, we digress. Yes. We digress. It's been, we it's been a very go, long one. Youth. It's been one of our longest ones, youth. So. Okay, well, edit at will. And uh, lovely to see you, oh, guys. man, and lovely Gary, to see you. And, and also, good point out, because we should point out, you were at the second ever Sources gig. So you've been a stalwart supporter. Well, that's us. right. And that was that was a fabulous... I remember the Half Moon and the Dingles Oh, you are at show. Dingles, yes. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And I think um, it's quite relevant, the Pistols thing, because, again, what you're doing with Sourceful is a recreation of something that was. Now... You know, I found at first, if I close my eyes, I've got to commend you both for the vocals. How you both handle the vocals are great. And, and actually, Gary, your, your guitars are really off the scale. And uh, Lee's obviously a, a, a phenomenal musician. But you close your eyes, you think, God, this actually sounds like what it, I imagine it would have sounded like. Mm -hmm. But then and I'd look up and I'd see Guy's face and I'd see Gary up going, what, that's not right, what's going <laughs> on? <laughs> but what's great is you've got the light show and you're in the shadows, you don't notice it, and it's a fabulous show. And I remember driving in Spain last year, they were playing some of the live album on the radio. It sounded phenomenal, so bravo, oh, congratulations. So. And, and a big hug and kiss to Nick as well. Enjoy the rest of the tour, guys. Have a blast Cheers, on the right. adventures. We'll finally get together. And, Thank uh, you. Look forward to seeing you when you get home. Right, man. Yeah. I found him really inspiring. I know, I could tell. Because it's the creative juices that are constantly flowing through that guy. Yeah, that's what I say. He's just always, you know, it, it's constant. It is constant with you. And I, actually, I've never talked to him about McCartney stuff in that sort of detail before, so that was fantastic to hear. His name sums up what we were talking about, though, doesn't it? To be called youth, and he's in his 60s now, and he's yeah, yeah, yeah. still full of the excitement and the passion that you need to make music. Yeah. McCartney's going to be yeah. 80 when this comes out. That's brilliant. Happy birthday, it. Paul. Happy birthday, Paul. We love you. If you ever fancy coming on the Rock on Sunday, exactly. yep. we're than here. Welcome. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> right. 
off we go. Uh, gig tonight. We've got a gig tonight in a place where we played before, which was way, way too small to get our stuff in, and had the most amazing audience who all sang along to Source for the Secrets. Yeah, it was brilliant. Yeah, and I'm looking forward to it. Yep, so it's a good night from me. And it's a good night from them. Mm -hmm.